of the John Edwin Rose Global Leadership Institute. I knew John and worked closely with him for nearly five years at the East West Institute. And I have to say, he was an incredible human being, an incredible visionary, a, a remarkable leader. Um, I think he's someone that, in my personal experience, had unmatched personal charisma and passion and was really absolutely, I think, both an American original and a global original. Uh, they broke the mold when they made John Rose, and I'm indebted to him for the way that my career has developed subsequent to my making his acquaintance and having the good fortune to work for and with John Rose at the East West Institute. So I want to say it really is an honor to be here under these auspices. The topic this evening is U.S. China relations issues, challenges, and prospects. And I want to talk uh, more briefly than I typically do. And you'll see me glancing down occasionally, uh, not just at my notes. My notes are not, not all that extensive, but more at the clock so that I don't go characteristically long. And that way, we can leave ample time for questions and discussion. But I want to talk about a couple of different things. And let me map that out for you this evening. Number one, I want to just say a little bit about the areas of continuity and the areas of divergence between the Trump administration and the current Biden administration when it comes to the US approach to China. And I'll try to be brief. That could be a fairly long presentation in itself. But I want to just hit the high points to kind of note where there is continuity and where there is change uh, at this still early juncture in the Biden administration. Number two, I want to say a little bit about the main issues that we see playing out in the relationship today. Uh, and specifically, what I would say are the seven issue areas that really represent the biggest sources of tension and turbulence in the relationship between the United States and China today. Uh, and I think, I think those seven issue clusters really cover the waterfront as far as where the where the conflict and where the tension is in the relationship uh, today. And they're all challenging issues, and I'll go through those very briefly. And finally, I, I, if uh, we have enough time, I want to just say a little bit about an important topic that's kind of a sub-element of all this, but that's really important. And that is the issue of what I regard as the deeper or underlying issues in the US-China relationship that we don't often talk about and don't often recognize exist, but that actually are where some of the real problems really lie. And the way I would put it in brief, and I'll talk about this a little bit more when I come to that section, is that the disagreements that the United States and China have on certain matters of policy or certain issues on the bilateral agenda are in many cases actually just symptoms of much deeper differences between the countries and much deeper dynamics that undergird everything that we actually disagree on. And in some cases, the seemingly intractable issue, whatever that issue may be, and I'll go through them shortly, is actually the easy part. The harder part is what leads to the fact that we have these disagreements. And I want to say a few words about that. Any of these topics could be the topic of a 60 or 75 minute talk, and I've done many of those in my career, but I will try to limit everything to 30 or 35 minutes total, and I am keeping an eye on the clock so that we maximize time for you to ask any questions that you have or to air any opinions and observations that you have, and including disagreements with my analysis. I am so glad to be back in a room with people again. Um, there's no substitute for it. And the opportunity to hear from people across this country in terms of their thoughts on China and the US-China relationship is very valuable to me. And I um, attach a lot of importance to that part of this process. So those are the things that I want to do in my brief remarks. And I'll, again, I'll try to cut back and give you a somewhat shorter version so that I can cover those three particular uh, topics. So with that, let me, um, let me just say, when we look at the Biden administration and where the Biden administration is on China today, um, we see a substantial degree, and I would say maybe even a 
um, surprising degree of continuity, I would say an unexpected continuity with the preceding administration. We also see some areas where there have been changes uh, in one way or another. And I want to go through <clears throat> what I see as the four major areas of continuity and the four areas of divergence or change in the way that the Biden administration thinks about and acts with respect to China relative to the preceding administration. So let's start with continuity. And here I'll try to be brief. Um, I could expand on this, but maybe we'll have the chance to do that in Q&A. But I'll, I'll just hit the high points. First of all, the Trump administration fundamentally believed that, and it was really almost the starting point for its fundamental view about China, that the old way of doing things, that is to say the old way that the United States had of dealing with China and engaging China, simply wasn't working for America anymore. That was the fundamental premise of the Trump administration's mindset about China. Whatever we were doing in the past as a nation under previous presidents, in the view of President Trump and his administration, it just wasn't working. So we needed to do something different. So I believe that the Biden administration also shares that view, that the previous way that the United States worked with China prior to the Trump administration didn't work well for America and didn't advance the interests of the United States of America. And therefore, the Biden administration sees that more or less the same way and operates on the same premise, namely that the old way of doing things was not a way that we wanted to continue. So that is the first area of, I would say, thematic continuity in terms of the US mindset about China. The second basic area, and it was a really dominant theme in the Trump administration, and we see it continuing in the Biden administration, is the idea of reciprocity. If there was a single word that summed up the Trump administration's approach to China, it was the idea that there needed to be, and there needs still to be, greater a greater level of reciprocity between the United States and China, particularly when it comes to the US-China trade and investment relationship. And to put it simply, the idea is that US markets have always been and continue to be far more open to Chinese goods and services than Chinese markets have been or are today to US goods and services. By the way, that is absolutely true. And the Trump administration basically said, we need to make this more reciprocal. And if China does something to us, we need to do it to them. If they restrict their market relative to us, we need to restrict it relative to them. And the idea of kind of balancing out the ledger was a really important theme. I think that theme continues in the Biden administration. So a desire for greater reciprocity is the second area of commonality that I would point out uh, exists uh, between the two administrations. <clears throat> Number three, there's no question that the Trump administration framed China as a formidable competitor in the United States. And that's putting it lightly. That, that would be sort of the minimum one would say. Uh, as I'll mention in a little bit, I think the Trump administration actually went much further and essentially framed China as the mortal enemy of America but they certainly framed China as the number one national competitor to the United States of America. And that notion of China as the most formidable competitor to our nation continues under the Biden administration. So there's no change there. That's the third area of continuity. The Biden administration has stated from the beginning and recognize I'll talk about some differences in a minute, but in terms of commonalities and uh, areas of continuity, the Biden administration said right from day one, uh, literally in the confirmation hearings for US Secretary of State and other cabinet officials and in the comments of President Biden and others, that China is the most formidable competitor that we have as a nation. And so that is very similar to uh, the Trump administration's mindset and that's, that's the third source of continuity. And the fourth thing that I would mention, <clears throat> and these are sort of just hitting the highlights rather than drilling down to a lot of other detail, just for purposes of time, is that the legislative and regulatory framework relative to China in the United States 
uh, remains essentially identical to what it was under Trump. And uh, I would say, if anything, there is a continuation along the same trajectory. And things are now being done that, uh, under this administration that continue the basic um, policy direction of the Trump administration with respect to legislation, which of course is a congressional matter, and also regulation and executive orders, which is an executive branch matter. And the bottom line is that the laws that came on the books during the Trump uh, presidency are not going off the books anytime in the foreseeable future, and they probably will never go off the books. And the executive orders that came into play when Donald Trump was president, uh, in virtually every case, remain on the books, even though Joe Biden has the inherent power as president to reverse them at any time. The fact is he hasn't done so. And so the legislation that we have that pertains to China and the regulatory and executive order in, um, environment that we're operating in is essentially unchanged uh, in this administration relative to the preceding one. So those are the four areas where we really see that there is a high degree of continuity so far, at least, in the way that the Biden administration approaches China and thinks about China and acts with respect to China when you compare the Biden administration with the preceding administration. But that all being said, there are some areas of divergence. And I want to talk about those because in some ways, they may be a little bit less obvious uh, than the areas of continuity. Um, and the first major change is that, and it's, it's an important one, it's in some ways semantic, but it, as you'll see, it's actually very significant. It is true that the Trump administration framed China as our most formidable competitor. But as I referenced earlier, it is also true that the Trump administration went further than that. And in the person of President Donald Trump and in the person of Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and other senior executive branch officials, and for that matter, members of Congress and others, typically from the Republican Party, the United States really spoke about China as an enemy. And the language that was used, the allegations that were made, and the tonality that was employed really put China de facto in the category of enemy of our nation. That was a major departure from the thinking of all previous US presidents of both parties dating back to Richard Nixon. So Nixon himself didn't see China that way as president nor did any US president of either political party subsequent to Richard Nixon and through the presidency of Barack Obama. But the Trump administration essentially departed from that framing and went further. The point that I wanna make here is that the Biden administration, it is very clear, does not regard China as the enemy of our nation. They do regard China as the most formidable national competitor that we face in the world, but they do not regard China, nor does the administration or the president, secretary of state, or other senior officials within the administration speak about China in the same language and tonality, very adversarially uh, in the way that the Trump administration did. One might say, well, what's the difference between the most formidable competitor on the one hand and enemy on the other? And the difference is two things, number one, a competitor is a country you compete with. An enemy is a country that ultimately you fight a war with. That's the very definition of the word enemy. And if you think about that important distinction, what you realize is that when you frame a country as an enemy, you start to calibrate your policies as if they were policies directed at an enemy. And that takes you in a very different direction in many cases, particularly in the military sphere, than framing a country as a competitor. And just to make this point even a little bit um, clearer, in the 1980s, as some of us in this room will remember, uh, the United States started to view Japan as an incredible competitor and an unwelcome competitor to our nation, to the point where you had sitting members of Congress going outside, taking baseball bats, and literally taking baseball bats to Hondas, Toyotas, and other Japanese cars as a way of showing 
disgust for the fact that Japan was um, an anger to the fact that Japan was competing with us, quote, taking our jobs, quote, infringing on our uh, dominance in the automobile market, and so on. Was Japan an enemy? Absolutely not. It was a treaty ally. It was a treaty ally of our nation. No way in the world was it an enemy, but it was a competitor. That's the difference between being thinking of a country as a competitor versus thinking of a country as an enemy. Well, the Biden administration rejects the framing of enemy, and that's the first difference that I would point to. The second area of change that I would note, and I'll be, try to be brief here, is the area of reciprocity. Whereas Trump and his administration basically said, whatever China does to us, we're going to do back to China. Whether or not it's good for America is less important. We're just going to do it to balance the ledger and to balance the books. And so if you hit me, I'll hit you. If you restrict you know, my imports coming into your country, I'll restrict yours. If you do this, I'll do the same, and so forth. And it was a kind of mindset of reciprocity at all costs, irrespective of whether the actual action advanced the interests of the United States of America or not. What I think we see with the Biden administration is, yes, an embrace of reciprocity, as I mentioned, and that's a commonality. But the difference is it's not reciprocity at all costs. It's, a, it's an approach to reciprocity that I, that I call, and I coined the term, smart reciprocity. And it's the idea of let's be reciprocal and let's seek reciprocity in the relationship where seeking reciprocity is good for America. But let's don't seek reciprocity where seeking reciprocity is bad for America. And that is a different mindset about reciprocity than the Trump administration had. And so that's a second area of divergence or change. The third area is that while I think the metric in my judgment, and I don't think it's a stretch to say this because I think one could cite a lot of comments from President Trump himself to substantiate this point, his metric was make America great again and America first, as he defined those constructs. And that was certainly his prerogative as president. He had every right as president to say, this is the policy course I want to set for the nation. And so his metric when he looked at a policy was not, in my judgment, and I think the facts bear this out, it was not, is this policy good for our nation? It was, is this policy, does this policy comport with my own self-defined political ideology of make America great again or America first? And if it seems to comport, or if, it, if I believe it will be perceived by the voting public as comporting with my ideology, I'll adopt it irrespective of whether it advances the interests of our nation. And a good example of that, because I recognize some people may say, well, David, are you kind of taking a, a pot shot um, politically at President Trump? But that's why, you know, and I'll, I'll recognize I'm a little bit old fashioned in this regard. I think, I think it make, it, it's important to have a factual basis to substantiate the things that you say and to substantiate your opinions. That's just an old bias that I have. And I know not a lot of people share that bias in this nation today. But I'm gonna give, give you a fact that, that, that makes that point. President Donald Trump introduced tariffs on incoming Chinese imports, namely about $380 billion worth of Chinese imports into our nation, which is the substantial majority of all Chinese imports. And he did so because he said it would reduce the deficit and he did so on the premise that he repeated many, many hundreds of times on the public record, no dispute about it, that it was China that was paying the tariffs. And the reality is, um, the facts is to say are that in fact, President Trump ended up presiding over the largest ever US merchandise deficit with China in the history of our nation over any presidency, bar none. He was the record holder. He left office as the deficit president of our nation, hands down, because the, the, the average annual merchandise deficit under his policies increased 17% over the Obama policies that he criticized as being a failure. That's the numbers. That's the numbers from the Trump administration. So the numbers are what they are. And the notion that these policies would decrease the deficit was simply false. And the numbers that. And the, the idea that China was paying for 
the tariffs was, of course, a complete, uh, absolute empirical falsehood. Just a, an absolute, demonstrable, empirical, factual falsehood. It's just not true. And uh, yet that was the premise of the policy. So did the tariffs, by any objective measure, help America by reducing the deficit, creating jobs, reducing prices for consumers? Absolutely not. It exploded the deficit, cost jobs, especially cost manufacturing jobs, cost jobs of the state of South Carolina, made things more expensive for consumers, and did absolutely nothing at all to solve any of the issues on the U.S.-China trade agenda. But it comported with his definition of make America great again and America first, and that's why we did it. That's why we as a nation, that's why the Trump administration did it. Now, I think that as we go forward, the Biden administration is going to take a different approach where the metric is not trying to align with a particular political ideology, but where the metric is, what is in the interests of the United States of America and the interests of American people? And I think that's a very different metric. And I would even say what I just said, although I, there's some judgment implicit in it, but I would, I would even say that without judgment, it is simply a different way of looking at the world. And I would argue that uh, that's what we're going to see from the Biden administration. The last couple points I would make is that I think um, to a far greater degree than the Trump administration, the Biden administration is going to be generally fact-based in its policy deliberation and policy formulation. And I don't think there's any disputing. And I, the, the tariff example is a good one to point out here that the Trump administration in many cases relied on um, predicated policies on factual falsehoods. Now, I'm not just saying opinions that I disagree with. That doesn't matter. The president has every right in the world to operate on the basis of his opinions. That being said, many of the policies were based on literal factual falsehoods. And of course, when you predicate a policy in factual falsehood, the likelihood that the policy is going to do what you think it's supposed to do is very low. Of course, that's what we saw with tariffs and some other aspects of the Trump approach to China. There's no question in my mind that the Biden administration, whether one agrees or disagrees with what it does, and there are elements of what it's doing right now that I disagree with, uh, in the, for the same reasons I disagreed with those actions when President Trump did them. But I think as a general rule, it's clear that this administration seeks to be more fact-based in its policy deliberation and formulation. I think that's going to be a, different, a difference. Two last things. One, America is going to work with allies and partners to a much greater degree than we saw under the Trump administration. As was observed by a number of, by many people, the, the notion of America first often devolved into America alone. And uh, it's very clear, including from recent developments just in the last two or three weeks, that the United States wants to work much more closely and in much greater uh, coordination and collaboration with allies and partners. And so that'll be an important difference. And finally, obviously, tonally and, in term and, and rhetorically, there will be significant, and there are already are very, very clear differences between the rhetorical style of President Trump and the rhetorical style of Joe Biden. And I don't think any of us would dispute that President Trump employed a juvenile style of communication that was, to put it neutrally, highly unconventional for any relative to any president in American history, and um, often set us back in terms of America's interests. And President Biden, and by the way, I'll give you an example of that in a second. President Biden has absolutely rejected that style of communication. The one example I would point to is COVID-19. Uh, we all remember the president of our nation saying things like China unleashed the China plague on America, or even grotesquely referring to uh, COVID-19 by the uns very unscientific and racist term, quote, Kung flu, in the words of President Trump, despicable and reprehensible language far beneath the dignity of the office of President of the United States or any office holder in this nation. And it was a disgrace and it brought shame and dishonor on the Oval Office and on our nation to hear a US leader speaking in this outrageous way. And President Biden put an end to that on January 20th, 2021. And we don't hear that kind of language anymore, even though we continue to hear very tough language and language of 
competition and so forth and so on. But there's a difference between saying a country is a competitor and hurling grade school level insults at the country in question. And we don't see so much of the latter anymore. So these are the ways in which I think by any objective measure, there are both areas of continuity and areas of change. And while in, in, a, in a certain sense, the continuity probably outweighs the change, which is surprising considering that both Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were very critical of Donald Trump on the campaign trail. And yet in, in fairness and in objectivity, they're continuing a lot of the policies they criticized, including the tariff policies. Um, and ultimately they're, they're complicit in these policy failures if they continue them much longer. But that being said, there are some significant differences and I think that's important to note. Let me briefly touch on what I see as the main issue clusters. And I'm not gonna go into all the detail here, but let me just outline it. And then I'll, I'll say a little bit as I noted I would about the, the deeper, some of the deeper dynamics that undergird um, the current bilateral agenda and current bilateral tensions that we see in this relationship. But I think to understand where we are and the level of tension and the level of turbulence that we currently see in the US-China relationship, it's important to understand the seven major issue areas that are contributing to that. And broadly speaking, I think these seven issue areas contain pretty much all of the controversial uh, areas in the relationship. I won't delve into them for time's sake, but it'll, I, I think you've read in the papers about all of these in recent weeks and months, and you'll understand what I'm talking about. Number one, the issue of Hong Kong. And this is kind of in reverse chronological order because this issue exploded into the, into the bilateral agenda about a year ago, or just over a year ago. <clears throat> and, and I'll go back um, kind of in reverse chronological order, but it's kind of the newest big issue to become a major issue in its own right. And that is in essence, China's decision in, in essence to roll back the uh, democratic uh, rights and protections that existed in Hong Kong uh, prior to the last several years and prior in particular to the adoption of something called the National Security Law, which came onto the books in Hong Kong in June of 2020, a little over a year ago. And before that, though there you couldn't say there was a, a fully functioning Jeffersonian democracy in Hong Kong, you could say that people that disagreed with the powers that be did in fact have the right to go out and express that disagreement and share different views and organize constituents and so on within the constraints of a sort of democratic-ish system that wasn't entirely democratic, but that at least allowed for people to express themselves. China has largely reversed that and essentially made it a crime de facto. This is not what the law says, but in its effect, it's essentially criminalized activities that used to be protected under the basic law of Hong Kong. And the US has a problem with that. Uh, many in Hong Kong have a problem with it. And that's become a major issue. Again, I won't drill down, but that's issue number one in terms of a reverse chronology. Issue number two, the issue prior to that that exploded onto the agenda was COVID-19. And on COVID-19, which obviously hits close to home to all of us, and I'm looking out at every person wearing a mask, and I was wearing a mask until I got special dispensation for this talk not to do so. We're all living with COVID-19 and the Delta variant and so on. This issue became a huge trust drainer and major league problem in the US-China bilateral relationship starting in early 2020. And quite frankly, uh, the Trump administration really led the way in politicizing this topic and making it a political talking point and basically saying China unleashed with intentionality the quote, in Trump's words, China plague, unquote, or as he put it, quote, Kung flu, unquote, on the American people with the particular purpose in mind of killing Americans and hurting our country. That's what he said hundreds of times. And that's what Mike Pompeo said and many others in the administration. And for that, many, for that matter, many Republicans uh, in Congress and particularly in the Senate. Well, that framing really demonized China and led to incredible um, changes in US sentiment toward China predictably and not, you know, not, uh, not surprisingly. 
Because when you have that message pounded in by many people from Trump and Pompeo to various senators on the Republican side and others, that message pounded home every single day, literally as a Republican talking point provided to Republican candidates by a Republican political consulting firm, and the memo was published. It's a matter of record. They said, hit China on this, and here's the words that you use, and here's how you do it. And they did, and it worked. And it took 25 points off of US favorable sentiment toward China, and it has very serious impact on the way Americans think about China. Never mind that a lot of that narrative was rooted in falsehood, but it, it nevertheless took hold and, and calcified as a narrative in this country. Did China botch its early response to COVID-19? Absolutely, yes. No question about it. But did they intentionally unleash the China plague on themselves and on us and on everyone in the world? Absolutely not. It's, it's, it's garbage. It's absolutely untrue. There's not a shred of evidence for it. And the United States has stated that. US CIA director and others have said there's not one shred of evidence. By the way, contradicting President Trump and Secretary Pompeo have stated there's not a shred of evidence to support that conspiracy theory. And yet it's taken hold. So COVID-19 became a huge trust drainer in this relationship. The third issue is trade. I won't dwell on that except to say it's a big issue and it's still unresolved. And um, you know, one could say a lot, but I think the basic idea is, to put it very simply, Chinese markets have not been as open to our goods and services as ours have been to theirs. No question that that is true. And that should be rectified. The only problem is that uh, Trump found a solution to the problem. It turned out the solution ended up being worse than the problem. And now we have a larger deficit with China than we've ever had in our entire history. And we've lost jobs, hurt consumers, and done nothing to solve any of the problems, nor had any impact on Chinese behavior whatsoever, except what we have done is given the pink slip to a whole bunch of American factory workers, some of whom are here in South Carolina. So that's an issue, it's unresolved, and that's gonna be there for a while. The fourth issue is technology. There's a huge competition right now between the United States and technology, uh, uh, United States and China with respect to the issue of technology. And basically it's a competition to become technologically supreme or to become the supreme or prime power in the world with respect to tech technologies such as um, artificial intelligence, quantum physics, advanced manufacturing, advanced robotics, biosciences, and a variety of other areas, green energy. And there's a huge competition. China is in that competition competing with us. We're in it competing with them. And it's a major, major source of friction and arguably, it's probably the, maybe the single most um, divisive element of or issue on the US-China uh, agenda right now. As odd as it may sound, I don't know that any other issue is seen as, as existential as the issue of technological competition um, because that fundamentally affects the direction of our economy and our ability to be a prosperous nation. And so there's a lot of competition around that. The fifth issue is military and security affairs, and this would include the issue of Taiwan. We can drill down on this in Q&A, but the idea is that um, China's military development, it's the development of its um, armed forces and its strategy are seen by the United States as a significant um, uh, trend that is concerning and that is troubling to American policymakers. China from its perspective, looks at the United States and believes that the United States is trying to hold China down, hold China back, and contain China, including in a military sense. And so there is, a, there is considerable tension within the military slash security sphere of the relationship. And most of that plays out on the periphery of China in the Asia Pacific region, whether with respect to the territorial dispute in the South China Sea, or the East China Sea, or the issue of cross-strait relations and the cross-strait balance of power between the mainland and Taiwan. So that's a big set of issues. And of all of those issues, Taiwan is a very significant issue that um, generates some pretty significant turbulence in the relationship, but probably to an even greater degree on a day-to-day -day or month-to-month -month basis, the South China Sea. And the fact that China has claims that are uh, viewed by the United States as inappropriate and unlawful, 
and China, for its part, disagrees with U.S. interpretation. And the bottom line is um, there's some serious tension there. Last two points, um, China's purported um, influence operations in the United States. So this has been a major theme. It's a ma major bucket of issues. And there's a lot of concern in the United States, kind of newfound concern since the end of 2017, something that no one talked about really before. But since the end of 2017, there's been a huge amount of attention paid to the notion that somehow China is nefariously seeking to inform and influence US public opinion in support of China's foreign policy objectives. And somehow that's regarded as an inappropriate thing to do. And of course, that is the very definition of public diplomacy. And it's what we do every day as a nation. It's what China does. And every country in the world that has the capacity seeks to inform and influence public opinion in the country in which they're operating to bring that opinion into a, a position of support of their own foreign policy. And yet there's demonization of China's efforts in this regard. And we see that as a major theme in the relationship. I should note as an interesting point that currently according to Pew and Gallup, US favorable sentiment toward China is at 20% and unfavorable sentiment is pretty close to 80%. Both of those are absolute record numbers uh, in the history of the relationship, in the history of polling relative to US sentiment toward China and certainly since 1971, 72, those are literally the lowest point in terms of favorable and the highest point in terms of unfavorable. That fact alone gives the lie to the idea that China is somehow incredibly effective at propagandizing the American people, because if it were effective, their numbers wouldn't be at 20% favorable and 80% unfavorable. And I think it makes it clear that the concerns around this set of issues are pretty